Hello again. Um, I'm Ed Boyer, and we're going to talk briefly today about guardianships because I have been thinking about guardianships for a long time. <laughs> and I'm going to give you everything you need to know about guardianships in a nutshell. Let's take a look at the evolution of legal determinations, capacity, and guardianship law. The basic question every society has to answer is how are they going to deal with the persons in society and those persons' property who cannot take care of themselves? Our tradition goes back to English common law and the concept of parents patriae. Common law had a way of dealing with those persons who were not able to provide for themselves, which became the modern day concept of guardianship and the seeds of our modern practices. The concept that the, that the state, or in, back in those times, the king or the queen, uh, protected persons and their property if they could not protect themselves. And when the revolution adopted the common law of England, um, it had basically adopted that same concept, and so the state provides through its laws for the protections of those persons who cannot protect themselves. Traditionally, the approach in guardianship has been a termination of incapacity that is routinely global. It's absolute determination of a person's ability to manage property, make personal decisions. It's an all or nothing deal. You're either all competent or you're all incompetent, and there was no in between. This was the tradition in the United States up to probably the 60s when things started to change. All or nothing, you were either competent or you're incompetent, and it was usually based upon some disability or a disabling condition or a diagnosis. So I practice in, in Florida, and this was when I went into practice in 78, uh, this was the norm. Our guardianship statute was an all or nothing thing. You'd walk into the courtroom, the judge would say, tell me about it, you sit down around a table and you tell the judge about it, and the judge would make a decision. There was no attorney for the alleged incapacitated person, the alleged incapacitated person was rarely there. There was little or no uh, medical testimony or evidence. Um, and this is the concept that we had. And so this all or nothing approach slowly began to change. The 1960s paradigm was that, and incidentally, there are three components for all guardianship and determination of capacity in the guardianship context in the United States. There is a diagnostic element. A person has such and such disease. There is a what developed later on, um, a sort of a functional er element and a, and a connection between the functional element, the diagnostic, and then uh, ultimately a cognitive element. And so you'll find in various guardianship statutes throughout the United States a combination of these three elements and a connection between, the, between them. So the, co the, the 60s paradigm was basically a combination of the medical and the functional. A finding of a, disability, a disabling condition, that was your diagnosis, and because of that condition, the person was unable to adequately manage personal or financial affairs, and the medical criteria was very broad and it was very label-driven. Their terms were used such as physical illness, advanced age, other cause, alcoholism, even in some states, uh, spendthrift, stuff like that. So persons, as an example in Florida, persons were believed to be incompetent because of. So there was the diagnosis, and it was uh, advanced age, alcoholism, drugs, and because of that, they were unable to manage their property. So there was the two of those together. In recent years, there's been a move toward a more specific functional standard, and the focus on the ability to provide for the essential needs, medical care, nutrition, clothing, shelter, and safety. The condition that causes the impairment is secondary. It's the ability to perform a particular function. The point being that the trend in modern years has been this person cannot perform this particular function. And because of their inability to perform this function, there's a harm to them, a risk to them, or, to their, or their property. And we don't really necessarily, for the purpose of guardianship, care what the cause is. The cause is important because a diagnosis is always important in determining what it is that's causing the inability to perform the function. But the focus is on the function, not on the diagnosis. And so modern reform statutes in the United States are moving toward this more specific functional standard and the ability to provide for your essential needs. The condition may be considered causal element, but it's not sufficient to establish the need for guardianship. And definitions have moved away from labels such as retarded, insane, alcoholic, or senile. And in fact, the ter this terminology goes back to common law. At common law, you were either an idiot, a lunatic, or a spendthrift. And the concepts um, were archaic terms um, and, that was, uh, and that was the basis for the findings um, at common law, and this followed through today uh, with the, in, the, in the 60s and 70s with the use of terms such as insane and retarded. Now, the latest trend, so remember you've got the 
the uh, um, diagnostic, and then the functional, and now they're moving toward a cognitive functioning. And basically, um, this either supplements or replaces one or both of the prongs of the traditional test being a diagnosis and because of the diagnosis and ability to function. UGOPSHA came in in 1997, and that's, the, I'm sorry, the Uniform Guardian, not UGOPSHA, but Uniform Guardianship Protective Procedures Act came in in 1997, defining an incapacitated person as an individual who, for reasons other than age, is unable to receive and evaluate information or make or communicate decisions, so that's the cognitive part of it, to such an extent that the individual lacks the ability to meet the essential requirements for physical health, safety, or self-care, even with appropriate technological assistance. So that's what the Uniform Act came in. Let me give you a thumbnail sketch of how it works throughout the United States. Connecticut is an example. Connecticut has a condition. It has functionality. Cognition is not stated. Mental illness, mental deficiency, physical illness or disability, alcoholism and drug addiction, addiction, and because of that, they're incapable of caring for themselves, the ability to provide medical care, nutrition, clothing, safe, and adequately heated and ventilated shelter and personal hygiene. This is right from the statute. Um, Contrary to that, you have Illinois, which has a condition, it has functionality and cognition. It has all three elements of, of those components. Um, mental deterioration, physical incapacity, mental illness, developmental disability, gambling, idleness, debauchery, high debauchery, whatever that is, excessive use of intoxicants or drugs, and the functionality is not fully able to manage person or state, and the cognition is lacks sufficient understanding or capacity to make or communicate responsible decisions. And thirdly, Tennessee, functionality is not stated, cognition is not stated, the court has to find the respondent is in need of assistance, and all they have there is a mental illness, physical illness, injury, developmental disability, mental or physical incapacity is the condition, and then the court has to find that they're in need of assistance. So that's, that's only using one of those components. Um, there's also this connection. No matter what element they use or what components found in the different states, all statutes require some connection. And here's the connecting words in Illinois. So spends or wastes the estate as to expose self or family to want or suffering. Florida, serious and imminent physical injury or illness more likely than not to occur. Oregon, serious physical injury or illness is likely to occur. So it's that nexus there, it's a connection. Person has this diagnosis and because of this diagnosis, um, they can't do this, this, and this, and then there's this, this serious uh, risk of harm issue that comes in, into play in most of them. 31 states make specific reference to a chronic use of alcohol or drugs. 35 states make reference to physical illness or incapacity. States that are undertaking guardianship reform now have eliminated advanced age as a condition, and advanced age alone does not imply deterioration in mental abilities. Uh, the research done by Erica Wood in 2000 of all the guardianship statutes in the United States said that most of them were blatantly discriminatory. What a surprise. Legal incapacity and guardianship. So the bottom, bottom line is there is no precision. Um, there is significant variation from state to state. And there is movement toward reform uh, in the 80s and 90s, as you can see from the Uniform Guardianship Protective Procedures Act in 97. Most of the reform came about probably in the late 70s and, or late 70s up to the late 80s. And this movement toward reform is interesting because certain commonalities, even though there's a lot of difference throughout the states, there's some commonalities that we're going to look at uh, in the guardianship process, uh, most of which have been as a result of the reform of the 80s. So imagine a perfect guardianship world. Not hard to do. Florida. Many states have one or a combination of the above models. In the late 80s, there was a shift in thinking about guardianships and there was a focus on functional capacity, which actually arose out of the treatment of the mentally ill and allow and trying to provide for as much autonomy and less restrictive treatment provisions for the mentally ill as possible. So this, this 80s reform came out of rethinking of the way persons with mental illness were treated and this shifted in thinking focused now more on functional capacity to the extent that in 89, Florida, the state I'm from, went through a year-long study of the guardianship statute and made a significant reform and legal, uh, in Florida, legal capacity is a purely functional test. For the adjudication purposes, the underlying diagnosis is irrelevant. Uh, can you perform a function? And they outline in the statute 13 rights, some of which can be removed, 
some of which can never be removed, some of which can be removed and delegated to a guardian. And then the process that's set up in Florida is there's an examination of each one of those functions and whether or not the person can perform those functions. And if they can't perform them, then the right to perform that function is removed. And that's the system you come up with in Florida. So the commonality you have in these modern times are two things we'll talk about in a minute. One is that you can end up with limited guardianships, which is the, in the terms of the reform, is the preference. And you look to less restrictive alternatives to a guardianship before, uh, before finding incapacity for purposes of guardianship. So Florida is one of the few states that's developed a purely functional test. Yes, diagnosis is important, but only in terms of trying to create a treatment plan. That's why they ask for it and in the, in the, look for it in the examining committee process, um, but the whole focus is function. Required finding in the statute in Florida that there's no less restrictive alternative. So many statutes are now saying, okay, the court first has to look around and say, is there anything that can do the job other than a guardianship that's less restrictive? And the court must make a specific finding in Florida that none exists. Then, only then, can the court appoint a, a, a guardian. So these two emerging concepts have now developed in the 80s and 90s less restrictive alternative guardianship and the concept of a limited guardianship. In 97, the Uniform Guardianship Procedures Act was adopted, provides for less restrictive alternatives, limited guardianships, guardianships, and how did this or why did this come about? And the catalyst for it was a movement in the United States to modernize guardianship law as a result of developments in the United States uh, press. That's what started in Florida was a, uh, an extensive expose by the Miami Herald about guardianships in Florida state reforms, and then there was also an ABA study, American Bar Association Senior Lawyers Division did a study on guardianship, lots of press, and, um, and you got uh, Uniform Guardianship Procedures Act came about and the reform uh, started out on its own. What are some of these alternatives to guardianship? The court would look and say, does the power of attorney do the job? Does the trust do the job? Do the advanced health care di directives do the job? What about jointly held assets? That could do the job. Maybe even having a care manager where the person cooperates with the care manager could be considered a less restrictive alternative to a guardianship. So the trend and the focus now is limited guardianships, less restrictive alternatives to guardianship, and the limited guardianship, for an example, as I mentioned, 13 rights in Florida, some removed, some removed delegated, some removed and can't be delegated. Other important concepts in modern guardianship law that we're going to look at right now, we're going to look at the examination process, which actually is tied in with the concept of a limited guardianship because the more thorough the examination process and the more elements it looks at and functions it looks at, the higher chance you have of having a limited guardianship. We're going to look at due process and the right to counsel. We're going to look at the adjudication process and the appointment of the guardian process, which all takes place in one, one thing. We're going to talk briefly about um, the concept of a competent guardian in modern guardianship statutes and the concept of restoration of rights in addition to other little uh, bits and pieces of, uh, of guardianship law throughout the United States. Let's look at the examination process first. What does research tell us? This was a study done um, by, it was headed up by Jennifer Moy, who's a PhD out of, out of Harvard and works at the VA hospital, she's a neuropsychologist, and Stacy Wood, Barry Edelston, all of these people, Erica Wood, are with either um, the, the um, National Guardianship Association, uh, Commission for Legal Problems of the Elderly, American Bar Association, or various well-known um, neuropsychologists who focus in the areas of guardianship. This group actually was involved in the preparation of the American Bar Association handbook on um, a guide for attorneys and representing clients with diminished capacity. They looked at clinical evidence and guardianships of older adults and they found that it was inadequate. And they did a three-state study. They studied 298 guardianship cases in Massachusetts, Colorado, and Pennsylvania. They analyzed the quality and the content of the examinations and the outcome of the examinations. And then they also graded the statutes for the states. Colorado got a B. It had just adopted the Uniform Guardianship Protective Procedures Act. Massachusetts received a D, was the least um, modern, least reform a statute uh, for guardianship, and Pennsylvania was kind of in the middle. They gave it a C. It was pretty extensive how they rated and graded these. Massachusetts subsequently, I think it was last year maybe, or the year before, changed its statute, um, which is now a lot less restrictive than it was. In any event, they looked at these 298 cases, and here's what they found. Two-thirds of the written evidence on medical assessment and examination was illegible, couldn't be read. 
information on specific functional elements was missing. It just wasn't there. Conclusory statements were common. I have examined this person and the person is incompetent, period. That's it, no substantiation, no elements, no functional assessments, nothing like that. So in these three states, Colorado had 34% of their guardianships with limited guardianship, limited in capacity. In Massachusetts and Pennsylvania, there was only one. Interesting stuff. So what do you look for in an examination in your state, in your statute? You look for who does the examination for capacity, how are they selected, how are the results presented? Are they presented by way of written reports, by way of testimony, by way of verified affidavits? And what evidentiary weight is given to these reports? You need to be aware if you get into guardianship of how this works out in the different states. Here's what we find. Florida, Kentucky, Maryland, South Carolina, a full professional committee with detailed reports. In Florida, we have three examining committee people, certain required professionals, have to file each uh, files a written report, five or six page report, which includes a functional assessment, a mental health assessment, and a physical assessment. And then they have to give their conclusions, their opinions to the court, and they have to give the, substantiate their opinions with behaviors they observed. Assessment by a physician or other professional with a court visitor. So a court visitor, like an attorney, and a professional, like a doctor, in Alabama, New Mexico, and Ohio, would go out and do the assessment. Other states, uh, Georgia, Louisiana, Mississippi, or is that Michigan? That's Michigan. Missouri and Rhode Island, a physician or a professional assessment, and sometimes in those states it's optional if the court really wants to do it, the court will appoint one. Other states, Delaware, New Hampshire, and Wyoming, no visitor or professional, nobody, but you have the right to a guardian ad litem or an attorney in those states, either if the court thinks it's a good idea or if you request one. So you can see there's a wide variety in the examination process. Here's how the Uniform Guardianship Protector Procedures Act deals with it. At or before the hearing, the court may order a professional evaluation. If demanded, the court shall, court shall order it. So this is somewhere between having none at all and Florida's where it's mandatory and there's three. Physician, a psychologist, or other qualified individual has to do the examination. They file the report and they have to show the nature, type, extent of the specific cognitive and functional limitations mental physical condition, educational potential, adaptive behavior, and social skills, and they have to give a prognosis and a recommendation. So the Uniform Guardianship Act um, is kind of somewhere in between uh, acts such as Florida and the nothing at all. The visitor concept can be called a monitor, an evaluator, or an ad litem. And there's a big dis distinction in the states as to what this person is. Uh, Florida doesn't use any of this. Florida has a court-appointed attorney and, it, and represents that person as an attorney subject to the same um, ethical considerations and guidelines. Some states and the Uniform Guardianship Procedures Act require a visitor and a professional exam. The court visitor is just that. They're the eyes of the court, but there's a distinction sometimes as to whether they are conceived, considered to be the eyes of the court or the representative and advocate for the alleged incapacitated person. Typically, they are the eyes of the court, but it depends on the statute. There's some case law that's kind of worked this out and there have been challenges to, to this concept. Um, and we'll show some of those in a minute. Sometimes it's not clear, but typically it's the eyes of the court. They interview the alleged incapacitated person, inform them of the right to counsel, so you can have the visitor who says, you have the right to an attorney. I know New York does this. I've had some cases back and forth. And an attorney can get appointed. Uh, they're advised of the right. The person wants one. They get an attorney. And they have the court visitor. Uh, the court visitor interviews the petitioner, visits the dwelling, obtains information from the physician, and makes recommendations to the court. They issues a report back to the court. In New York, typically, they're attorneys. But they can be anybody. Weaknesses of the examination process. The weaknesses are that there may be no professional examination. There may be no examination at all. There typically can be a lack of focus on functional abilities and an over-reliance on in in instruments like the MMSE. Useful but not a diagnostic instrument as we saw in one other session on capacity. To give you an example, mini mental state exam, 30 questions. You answer these questions. And in Florida, there's 13 functions that would be removed from you. One would be, as an example, determining residence, traveling, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The mini mental state exam doesn't ask you specific questions about what would you do to travel, how would you prepare for a trip, how would you go to Chicago in January, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They would simply ask you these 30 questions, which would show impairment in certain areas, and then the examiner would make a great big leap and say they can't travel because they got a 24, 22, or 23 on the minimal state exam. That's the limitation is over reliance on those. As an example, on the minimal state exam, there's a clock drawing test. There is um, 
you know, remember three words after three minutes. There's the serial sevens, that's counting from 100 backwards by seven, and then subtract seven each time you go, which can be kind of confusing. I have a little hard time that with, that with myself. So if you say 100, subtract seven, mm, that's a 93, subtract seven from that. That gets a little hard to start using your fingers. But if you switch it around and say, subtract 10 and add three, subtract 10 and add three, subtract 10 and add three, it gets a lot more easy to do. So uh, that's, people rely on this and, and there are errors and drawbacks and limitations on how you deal with it. Useful, but not a diagnostic instrument. So the right to count, the right to counsel, mandatory or optional, Gideon versus Rain, Wainwright, remember that from back in the 60s, I think it was 1960 or 61, criminal, right to counsel, typically that's not the case in guardianship proceedings. Federal case here out of the Fourth Seventh Circuit in 78, a state is not constitutionally compelled to provide counsel for an alleged incompetent person who's ended up having more rights removed actually than a criminal. In any event, there's a lot of state diversity. All jurisdictions provide for the right to counsel. Not mandatory, but they provide for a mechanism where you can have it. A mandatory appointment in almost half of the states. Others like Illinois, Indiana, Rhode Island, South Dakota, and Virginia, only if requested. Massachusetts and Mississippi and New Jersey, it's not stated at all. But usually there's a case law indication uh, in the cases that you would be entitled to it if you request it as a basic right, right to counsel. <clears throat> Considerations, wing spread 1988, wing span 1989, and just recently this last year in Salt Lake City um, was the National Guardianship Conference. They do these every 10 years. They discuss issues like this. What did they talk about initially in 88? And I remember being at the one in, in uh, 98 was at Stetson University College of Law, and the topic was continued to be the discussion of whether or not a person uh, who was the attorney was a zealous advocate or not. The majority in wing spread believed in mandatory appointments. A minority raised the issues that it goes too far and might not be in the respondent's best interest, and of course it adds extra cost to the process. Um, the role of the attorney, zealous advocate or benevolent protector, guardian ad litem. There's still a great deal of controversy about that in the guardianship context. The ABA model rules, the preamble, a lawyer is representative of clients. As a representative, a lawyer is to explain to the client the client's legal rights and obligations. He or she is to represent the client zealously and assert the client's position or the rules of the adversary system. Florida started out like that, and then two or three years after the new statute was adopted in 89, they said, the role of the attorney is to represent the interest of the alleged incapacitated person, and then they added the phrase two years later, uh, consistent with the rules governing the Florida Bar. So it, it put in, seems and seemingly put in Rule 1.14, representing clients with diminished capacity, so it's questionable whether the zealous advocacy is mandatory or not, and maybe it depends on attorneys, case by case. Here's the case law. Uh, to year 2000 in Maryland, the attorney was acting through the proceedings as an investigator for the court and not an attorney. That person waived the ward's right to present in hearing and contrary uh, toward the ward's wishes, filed a report that was contrary to the ward's desires to have a non-family member guardian, and basically the argument was that the attorney was virtually the principal witness against the ward's stated position. Hmm. Uh, Henry MR, 638 Atlantic Second, that's a Jersey case from 94. Uh, case representative of the position taken by most courts that reject the guardian ad litem standard and expect counsel zealously to advocate the preferences of the proposed ward, or if none have been expressed, to attempt to resist the imposition of the guardianship. Make them do their job. That's the majority position. Let's look at the adjudication process. All states permit attendance at the hearing. Some states mandate it, but permit waiver. Some states mandate it. New Mexico, that's the ones that mandate it. Minnesota. That's not Minnesota. Yeah, it is, I guess. New Mexico, Utah. Some states exclude appearance if not in the best interest of the ward for good cause. If it's home for all, the person would be disrupted. Optional locations. Uh, residence can be the location for the hearing, convenient place, or location in the best interest of the person. Here's the Burks, an Ohio case. Um, guardian appointed in the AIP in Florida visited the nieces. Ohio law does not mandate the presence of the AIP because the process to appoint a guardian is non-adversarial. The probate court's function is to do what is in the best interest of the alleged incapacitated person. So this one person was uh, visiting nieces and they popped them with a guardianship and the court said, uh, no, nope, don't have to be there. Standards and burden of proof. Guardianship is a legal, not a medical issue. The presentation of evidence depends upon the state's model of legal capacity. 
If the underlying medical requirement, then the evidence of medical condition is important and would be presented. If there's purely a functional test, the evidence of lack of ability to function is presented. If there's a cognitive element, then the evidence of a person's inability to make responsible decisions is the basis for proof. The burden is on the petitioner. Everyone is presumed to have capacity. Once incapacitated, the burden is on the ward to go forward for restoration. However, some states still place the burden to show ward that the ward still is incapacitated on the one advocating guardianship. And there's a case site for you. In most every case, the overwhelming majority, the standard is clear and convincing evidence. That's one of the highest standards in the law. That doesn't mean, and there are case, cases that say it, doesn't mean you can't have conflicting medical testimony and still meet that standard. You can. Uh, New Hampshire beyond a reasonable doubt. A very few, Wyoming and Maine, uh, preponderance in the evidence, and some if the court is satisfied of the, that the allegations are sufficient in those states. Here's two cases that deal with the standard. Um, an individual can't be com civilly committed without clear and convincing evidence. And in the read the guardianship of Hughes, May 98, the constitutional right to due process is satisfied by the use of a preponderance of the evidence standard. The lower standard is acceptable because the potential infringement on the liberty interest of the guardianship of a guardianship was not as extreme as that of a civil commitment. So those are just some cases for your for your arsenal. The evidence, typically there's no special rules of evidence for guardianships. Uh, and typically the rules of evidence and rules of civil procedure will apply. However, you find you will find in most courts because the focus is on protecting uh, a person with diminished capacity, uh, the courts can tend to be loose. Uh, the mechanism in Florida is you can declare it to be adversarial, but the rules of evidence are not to be strictly applied in some cases. A reliance on stipulations a lot of times, a reliance on telephonic testimony. Um, medical testimony can't be presented by affidavit, um, and that's a Wisconsin case, must have the right to cross-examine. and in um, in Reed Bonesteel, conservatorship petition dismissed based upon the ad litem's report stating the AIP was capable. Uh, and they said, no, oh, you still have to have a hearing. Trial by jury. Some states require it, Kentucky. Some states permit it upon request. And that's a bunch of them. Because the common law, in fact, it, it, at common law, England, in medieval England, it was actually a jury of people in the community that got together if someone filed a petition with the uh, uh, with the chancellor to have you declared to be a spendthrift and an idiot or lunatic, and the jury would actually make that decision. That has come down to us today. Initiating the guardianship. Who can do it? How do you do it? And what's the procedure? Well, it's state-specific, and there's no federal law on guardianship. And the question is, you, you do a petition. You either have a petition for incapacity combined with a petition for guardianship, or you have two separate petitions. Who can do it? 45 states use the term interested person. Well, what does that mean? Typically, it's somebody who can reasonably be expected to be affected by the outcome of the proceedings. And in some states, you can stress, stretch that pretty far. A neighbor, a bank teller, adult protective case worker. So who can bring the petition is pretty flexible. How do you do it? A petition which includes a lot of this stuff here, the nature of the guardianship, the nature of the property, the nature of the incapacity, name, age, residence, name, address of the proposed guardian, spouse, close relatives, presumptive heirs. State specific again, attending or treating physician's name. These are some state specific uh, things that have to be in the petition. Persons with knowledge, steps taken to find no alternatives, um, sworn medical examining report, other pending or existing guardianships, uh, the native language of the person, that sort of thing. Uh, notice requirements. Notice is statutorily required in all states except Alabama, Louisiana, and I guess that's Mississippi. I still go back to the old days with the four digits, you know. Without regard for mental state, notice to relatives, how you define it, form and time after filing, varies hugely. Who may serve as guardian? The Uniform Guardianship Act says any qualified person. Florida says any resident who sued jurists in 18. Other states say things like an adult individual or corporation, any person suitable or willing. The focus on here as to who may be guardian basically is typically the statute would create a priority. Say, here's who can act, here's who can't act, here's the priority who will select, and then it will almost always defer to the court being, having the uh, flexibility to make the decision based on what's in the ward's best interest. So that's, that's what you're gonna find in most states. Who may serve the typical issues are the priority, the extent of the court discretion, qualifications, considerations of the ward's wishes, the relationship, conflicts of interest. Uh, there's a movement afoot in the United States now 
uh, as evidenced by New Mexico, Colorado, and Florida, to have guardians taking courses to be qualified, mandatory courses for family members, certification for professional guardians, uh, a movement toward having a professional guardian who is qualified. Um, most states have, pri have statutory priority, but clearly give court wide discretion. And that's the Uniform Act in Florida, North Carolina, and Michigan. Qualifications, the trend is toward education and training. The NGA um, now has a guardian and master guardians examination. And Florida, Arizona, and West California, uh, I misstated Colorado, uh, these now have a movement towards certification. Florida has certification for professional guardians and mandatory education for family members. Types of guardianships. In ending, I will share with you that there are all these other types of guardianships. There's a natural guardian, which typically would be the parents for a minor child for purposes of a settlement for a certain amount of money or less. Settlement of a claim, inheritance, automobile accident. Over a certain amount, typically you will be required to have a guardian, and that's where you end up with a guardian of the minor. A guardian of the minor, um, is a circumstance where a certain amount of money comes into the hand of the minor and you have to petition the point, uh, to appoint a guardian. There's no examination or adjudication process uh, and they're typically a lot less expensive um, uh, to obtain. There's a pre-need guardian. That's a movement now in most states where you actually sign a document ahead of time saying who you want your guardian to be if you should become incapacitated. In most of the states where that pre-need guardian is provided for, it's still optional with the court based on the ward's best interest of whether or not that pre-need guardian will be appointed. There's a standby guardian uh, where you can actually provide for somebody, if there's one guardian, we have another one, a surrogate guardian, where guardians go on vacation. If they're professional, somebody can step in for them. There's a voluntary guardianship where you have capacity, but you request the court for assistance. The doctor says, you understand guardianship and the nature of the delegation that duties the guardian, but I want this person to manage my property because I'm physically disabled, uh, disabled. And the voluntary guardianship is alive and well in Florida. Uh, it's not widely used in other states. You also have veterans guardianships with special statutes. And in many states like Florida, you have what's called a guardian advocate or some method of guardianship for persons with disabilities. And the assumption is the person has always lacked capacity. And so why go through the adjudication process? So in Florida, the guardian advocate is, is appointed after a petition using school records, um, the medical records. There's no adjudication, there's no examination process, and no rights are technically removed. You still have the right to counsel. Once the guardian is appointed, the guardian becomes the guardian for all purposes. So what's this guardianship terminology stuff? It varies from state to state. Uniform Guardianship Protective Procedures Act, um, Uniform Probate Code says the guardian is for person in medical matters, and they use the term conservator for property and financial matters. Florida uses guardian of the person and guardian of the property. Louisiana calls it interdiction. Uh, California has multiple uh, conservators. Conservator for this, conservator for that, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But many of the states distinguish between conservator and guardian. When they say guardian, they mean person only. In Florida, they say guardian of the person and guardian of the property, and it varies throughout the states. Ending the guardianship, that's called a suggestion of capacity. If it's by the person who has their rights has their rights restored based upon their capacity uh, coming back. Death, running out of money, moving out of the jurisdiction and disappearing, uh, and when you can't find the ward, which is moving out of the jurisdiction and when you're disappearing. The biggest thing you need to know about guardianship in modern times is the problems of moving guardianships from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Many states have now adopted UGOPSHA, the Uniform Guardianship Jurisdiction Protective Procedures Act, if I got that right. And that basically fixes jurisdiction in one location if there are multiple jurisdictions and provides priority based upon a definition of what's called a home state or what's person, what would be considered a person's uh, connection state, significant connections. And, and, the, and if, if, in fact, the Uniform Act is adopted, it will make it a lot easier to pre prevent things like granny stealing and to have some type of uniformity in jurisdictions because every guardianship statute is different. General principles. On termination, that's repetitive. Uh, you can read that uh, in the materials. And there's the restoration under UGOPSHA, under, I'm sorry, the Uniform Act. If the petition presents a prima facie case for termination, the court terminates it unless it's proven that con the continuation is in the best interest of the ward. Once the prima facie case is made, the burden shifts to those opposing to prove continuing of the guardianship by clearing convincing evidence. It's much harder to have somebody declared incapacitated than it is to have their rights restored. Be careful out there.